So we're in the seventh Sunday of the Easter season, and Pentecost Sunday is coming, where we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent to his believers after ascending into heaven. And as I study the scriptures for today, after reading John's gospel, I ended up delving deeper into what Jesus meant by sanctification and the truth. And when it was all done, I realized my sermon is about sanctification in the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. Some preachers can name their sermons weeks in advance, but mine always gets a name when I'm done. <laughs> so in the Episcopal Church, Catechism of Faith, in the back of our uh, Red Book of Prayer, the significant, it says the significance of the resurrection is that Jesus overcame death and opened up for us the way to eternal life. And so, you know, by our baptism, we are sanctified. We're sanctified by our parents. We're sanctified by the priest. We are sealed as Christ's own forever. And if we grow up in the church, or as we learn more, as we involve ourselves in, in church activities and the scriptures, we begin to learn more, and as we believe more, we become more sanctified. The Gospel of John's chapter 17, we have this powerful intercessory prayer that Jesus is giving. The disciples are listening in, and he's praying to God. So we have the word of God praying to God. Talk about the power of prayer. This is a powerful prayer. And it dawned on me after reading this prayer several times that, you know, I know as we read up to this point just before Jesus' arrest, he's telling the disciples, you know, that he's headed to the cross and he's, he's giving them information and, and preparing them. And, and, and you sometimes feel he's preparing himself as well. He's getting more re resolved and, and uh, you know, he's, he's set for the cross. But after reading this prayer, if, you know, he knows now what God's plan is for the world. I mean, it, it's now very, very clear to him. And it's a series, really, of acknowledgments as to, you know, what he knows is coming from his impending crucifixion and resurrection. Now he prays for these three things for the disciples. He prays for his glory to continue in the world through that love and trust that he has built with these 12 men over the last three years. And so he, he's praying for this, his glory to continue once he's gone through that love and truth that binds them. And then he also prays for their continued protection. You know, it's been a dangerous situation for them already. He knows it's going to get more dangerous as it comes. And once he is crucified and resurrected and the, the disciples witness that, and they know that truth, and they hang to that truth with their lives, that is going to be even more dangerous. So he's praying for their protection. And he talks about how he's been protecting them, and that none were lost except for the one destined to be lost. And that's another part where he predicts what's going to happen with Judas, and why it's going to happen. And then he prays for them to be sanctified in the truth, that God's word is truth. And so for the disciples, you know, we, we now know that Christ was arrested and crucified, and he rose again. He rose from the dead, and they witnessed this. And by their witness, again, they're sanctified by that witness. They believe in that, they believe in what happened, they believe in what they've been through, and they believe in what's happening and what's to come. And this Holy Spirit's going to come to bring them more power to hold that. And they have eternal life. And 
so after his resurrection, Jesus remains with the disciples and many others that he met over 40 days. And St. Paul is the last documented witness to see the resurrected Jesus. And he stressed in his first letter to the Corinthians that most, the most important thing to Christians is the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. He put it plainly in his letter. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He says in his letter that more, there are more than 500 witnesses to the resurrected Jesus. Many of those people will become Christian martyrs because they're unwilling to forsake what they know to be true. And knowing how truly difficult it's going to be for these eyewitnesses, in the book of Acts, Jesus' last words are documented. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Our reading in Acts, we find the disciples gathered in Jerusalem, as Jesus had instructed them to do. They're with 120 or so other followers, other witnesses. Mary's with them. And they've been praying constantly and waiting for the Holy Spirit. And Peter, who's attributed to starting the Christian church, he calls what could be called the first church annual meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is to go over why Judas, who Peter says was once numbered among them and allotted his share of the ministry, became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. And knowing many of those who were present might not know what became of Judas, he's going to cover that too. So at first he covers the why by acknowledging what he heard in Jesus' prayer, that the deeds of Judas were the fulfillment of scripture. And then what happened to Judas as written in this passage, wasn't included in our reading today. Judas was so full of despair, despair that Peter reports, and this is somewhat paraphrased, purchasing a, that after purchasing a field with the blood money, he fell headlong, burst open in the middle, and all of his intestines gushed out. So the question comes to me, is why the Revised Common Lectionary has us retell this exact set of scriptures every three years, and we skip over these two verses. I mean, it is true, if you read the entire passage, this passage can be preached upon as a really good model for church meetings. <laughs> you know, they cover the old business, and they cover the new business, and they have a proper process of election, most of all, they pray, and they ask for God's will to be done. I mean, maybe it's the, you know, gushing, the intestines gushing out that doesn't preach that well now in 2015. <laughs> you know, we, we don't know why certain verses are left out in the common lectionary, but this line of thought started me thinking, and it just started to make me think about how sometimes we, a lot of times, we want to shield ourselves from the despair in the world around us. As a privileged American living in the Midwest, just by mere location, at least to date, you know, it's a really nice place to be shielded. Um, but this way of life, I, you know, seems to have been handed down over time. And this carrying on as if it isn't happening is a way of living that we have. Somehow, as the disparity in the world grew, our coping mechanisms also matched that, and it evolved. 
And then I think about those 120 eyewitnesses of the resurrection in that upper room, waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit to be sent. You know, they were left behind by Jesus to face this cold, cruel, unbelieving world. The Holy Spirit hasn't yet come. And they're gathered together, but how empowered they are. You know, because of what they witnessed. God came to earth in the form of a man. And he worked through Jesus to establish a new covenant with the world. So we could receive the Holy Spirit that would guide us and keep us close to him forevermore. And so that we, too, could carry out the work that Jesus has taught us to do. And these eyewitnesses go on to prove that they can face anything, even death. And it's because of their testimony that we can enjoy the inheritance of Christianity and the privilege that we have. And so I pray that whenever we gather together as a church, be it on Sunday morning, be it in meetings, that we're reminded, as the writer of the book of Acts reminded the early church in this first church meeting, where Peter doesn't spare the gory details of what became of Judas, that we learn not to lose sight of the world that is around us, where there is so much despair. Where there's hunger, where there's thirst, where there's poverty, where there's injustice and war and violence going on for some people all the time. We must realize that we have been empowered to make a difference. And this gift of the Holy Spirit that God has given to us, which we know to be true because of Jesus' resurrection, being sanctified in this truth isn't meant to load a bunch of guilt on us. You know, Jesus already saved us from that. He lifted that from us. But it's as a way of keeping present that we are people who have inherited the vision of a peaceful world for all people. So to get, today we gather to worship 20 centuries removed from those 500 people who were witness to Jesus' resurrection and the 120 who gathered together in Jerusalem committed to testify as they wait for the Holy Spirit. And we were not there, but we have their testimony from God through the scripture. So as we wait to celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit this week. Let's pray that we too are sanctified in the truth of the resurrection. And like our forefathers, let us carry out the work that God has given us to do, to love and serve him as faithful witnesses of the risen Christ our Lord. Amen.